That's one of our main missions too, is, is getting more women in STEM, more women around water, more women that are willing to be out boots on the ground advocating for our watersheds. Welcome to the Woman Angler and Adventurer Podcast, inspiring real women with a passion for fishing and the outdoors to go get their adventure on. Now, here's your fearless host, Angie Scott. Welcome, Woman Angler and Adventurers and listeners. Thank you for tuning in. If you like what you've been hearing on the show and you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a rating and review on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, uh, Stitcher, on and on and on. If we're not on a platform that you listen to, let me know, Angie at thewomanangler.com, and I'll make sure the show gets loaded on there as well. So in this week's episode, I have a really fascinating lady, Amy Robison, a.k.a. The Pond Lady. Amy is also a special correspondent on the Fish Nerds podcast, which was featured on last week's episode, where Clay Groves and John King interviewed little old me. So private ponds are a topic that we haven't really covered on the show thus far. Where I grew up in Minnesota, that wasn't really common, but I know in other parts of the country... Uh, private ponds are really popular. I remember I took a trip in high school to Ohio and it seemed like everybody's house we went to visit that day had their own private pond. Um, And there's quite a bit in Oklahoma and that's where Amy is from. So uh, she used to work for the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation and then just kind of went off on her own in helping people get their their ponds in tip-top shape. Uh, for their stocked fish, and uh, it's really, really, really interesting. So please join me as I jump into a conversation with the pond lady, Amy Robison. Here we go. What sparked your interest and led you down this path? Well, um, so in Oklahoma, there is more shoreline than any other state in the nation. We have over 300,000 ponds. We have lots of big reservoirs. And my dad and granddad um, took me fishing a lot. Um, My dad would take me sun fishing at the local lakes where we lived in Stillwater, which is where Oklahoma State University is. Uh, my grandparents, his parents were, my granddad was an avid fisherman and they would be uh, most likely to take their RV over the summer and go to a lake and set up to be the people that take the day fee at the booth. And in return for that job, they would get, you know, free RV hookups. So that essentially my granddad had a summer long vacation at a lake every year. <laughs> yeah. So depending on where we where they would end up, we would go to that lake for a few days every year and, and fish with my granddad. And I remember being a, a little girl and him bringing in catfish bigger than me. You know, I must have only been like seven or eight years old and maybe 40 pounds at most. But seeing those huge catfish, and I'm sure they weren't actually larger than me, but at that size, you just think, oh, my oh, God, yeah. that that's a monster. It came out of the water, granddad. That's a, that's amazing. And Rather than being afraid, I was just immediately obsessed. I needed to know what was in every piece of water we saw all the time. (laughs) And so I I got interested in getting into fisheries very early on and was obsessed with aquaculture because they took us to, um, there are a couple of trout hatcheries in Missouri that you can go as a civilian and, you know, you can feed the fish, things like that. Um. And just seeing, even though I'm not, I'm not a huge trout fan, so hopefully nobody docks me for that, but they're not a native species here in Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Um, they are in Missouri, but we would go and, and just get to feed the fish and see them popping. And, and I, I was just absolutely in love. I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to grow fish. I want to make fish babies. This is what I want to do. And it, well, it, it quickly morphed into wanting to do more of the actual fisheries management side of getting to do all of the sampling and using all the gear, getting to get on the shock boat. That was when it really turned for me. Okay. Uh, my mom got her master's at the same university where I got my undergrad. So there was a couple of opportunities where I got to go out into the field with her for some of her classes just as a volunteer 
And uh, because the professors knew me and I signed a, a release waiver, they would let me go out in the field sometimes. And that uh, that was in high school. So I was already getting to go out in the field and do some fisheries related sampling stuff when I was in high school. And by the time I was in college, I was raring to go. Nice. So what did um, your mom study? My mom, my parents are both science educators. Okay. So she was getting her master's of t- technology there. She, she got her undergrad in uh, science education and then her, she got her master's of technology, which is the, the degree program, master's degree program they offer down there. And then now my parents both teach at, um, junior colleges in Tulsa. Okay. In fact, uh, my dad's been a, an educator at the same university for over 15 years, and he just lost his job due to COVID. Oh no! So it's uh, it's um, they've they've they're uh, they've always been in academia. Mm-hmm. So I don't, you know, like I think my dad has a way deeper understanding of some of the stuff that we do because he did grow up fishing and being around fisheries. My mom is just sort of. Uh, naive about what we do. So seeing some of the videos from our YouTube channel, I think has really been eye opening for her. I don't think she ever realized how hard we work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if that makes sense, like how hard it actually is to get out there and do this stuff. But um, no matter how hard the work is, I always find something to be fascinated about that keeps me going. Yeah. And so it, it progressed from being in school to do fisheries management stuff and wanting to get out on big waters and work with larger endemic species like gar and paddlefish. And just sort of having a bad experience in the department made me switch directions. I, I, my husband was already doing nuisance wildlife control. He had already developed Robison Wildlife Solutions to do nuisance wildlife control and land management for private landowners. So he had a couple of people that he was helping with burn plans and things like that. And he was batting around the idea of adding pond services, but me working for the department, it was conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't have anything to do with anything at all. Um, Even the wildlife related stuff, I was like, eh. It's not technically my division. I'm fisheries, but still, that's a little too right. close to my territory. So me being who I was and who I am, it's like I can't be on any of the documents. I can't be even a silent partner. I can't be associated or affiliated with the business at all. This is all you. And so we just started really seeing a need for people that would call and, and have problems with their ponds. And we could tell them over the phone how to fix it. But we didn't really have anybody in our department that we could send out to actually do the work. Gotcha. We just did. That's not yeah. what the department is designed to do anyway. They'll consult over the phone, but they really can't send people to every pond that needs help. So unless you're having a fish kill event or something drastic is going on, chances are you're not going to be able to get them to come out. So um, we batted around the idea of, of developing this. In fact, my my previous boss before I left the department after I didn't get that second promotion or the same promotion the second time you know he he really felt like he'd failed me as a supervisor and and uh, we we had sort of talked about you know what what he thought about me doing something like this so whether whether he thought it would work from his his angle of being in the department whether hubby thought it would work from his angle of being outside of the department all of us all kind of agreed that this was a great path for me. And we came up with the pond lady. And so the pond lady project was born and we have really developed far beyond what I ever thought we could become in such a short period of time. It's really snowballed and, and taken on a life of its own. Yeah. And for me, that's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Um, I've always told people like, Oh, when they say you're going to be famous, like, no, I don't want to be famous. I prefer to be infamous. <laughs> Infamy is way more where I'm comfortable. <laughs> Fame just sort of sounds like too much work. Right. I'd rather be over on this side where it's not really a it's not really a job in itself. It's just a it's an artifact of being who I am. So <laughs> Right. So uh, real quick, yeah. what was it about the shock boat that like intrigued you so much or well, and here's my dirty secret as the pond lady. And this is something that I always think is funny, especially when speaking to avid anglers, is that I am a terrible angler. <laughs> I have no patience. I have no uh, no gut, no instinct for how to work a line. I get tangled. 
I I can think like a fish, but not whenever I've got that rod and reel in my hand. <laughs> I can I can grow fish. I can talk to fish, quote, 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 unquote, talk to fish. I cannot get them to hit on a line. <laughs> so it was it was just being not very good at angling and therefore not getting to see a lot of fish if I was out on my own and wanted to see a fish. And with that shock boat now, you know, we may not be able to go out in public waters and just shock for fun, but I can wait until we can go to a pond and then I see all kinds of fish <laughs> pop up all over the place. It's an instant gratification thing. Yeah, That's really what it is. It's you. just about instant gratification. <laughs> so me me being much more instant gratification driven, I don't have the patience for angling. So I get to see a lot of fish in a really short period of time. And then I also get to know that I, you know, did something good for the landowner we can develop a good plan for them and that we're going to make the fishery better that's always super satisfying and gratifying too so um so, it's just addictive it's addictive gotcha so what what goes into um pond management like what makes uh, uh the best environment for for the fish in that pond well, um, it's all about balance. Okay. So uh, a lot of our pond systems are older. In Oklahoma, the landscape of ponds, most of them were not designed to ever have aeration systems in them. Mm -hmm. And people have not been super well educated on just pond processes in general, the ecology of a pond, the, the aging process, what happens when ponds start aging. So for the most part, the majority of what we do is actually pond restoration, which okay. is, you know, my pond has systemic algae problems or it's got an aquatic nuisance vegetation type that has completely choked out the pond and eliminated any access for angling. Um, so a lot of times we have to get the ponds back to a state of being useful again, usually adding aeration getting them on a probiotics regimen, um, if we can, if it's feasible, getting a phospholock treatment in to lock out any available phosphorus, which is what drives a lot of the nuisance algae blooms and blue-green algae blooms especially. But um, <clears throat> as far as the fishery goes, in terms of the actual fish themselves, um, actually being able to go back and do the sampling sometimes isn't really feasible until you get everything else in control. Mm -hmm. So if you've got massive algae problems or a vegetation type that's so thick that you put the shock boat in the water and start producing current, the fish get stunned and then they get trapped in vegetation. You can't get a net on them, mm -hmm. so you can't get them in the boat. And it's just a wasted effort. So a lot of times we do have to do the restoration part of pond management first before we can actually go back with the shock boat and, and address manipulating the fishery to get better growth. And a lot of times the management recommendations for that come about from the sampling effort itself are, you know, you, you have this uh, size class of bass that we can tell we've got some stunting going on. So you need to remove about 30 pounds of these guys. Or, you know, you're missing a couple size classes here, so we need to supplementally stock a few guys at this size, things like that, wow. so that we can modify the system based on the, the, the size is super important, too. And we do everything based on weight per acre. So a lot of the old school stocking uh, recommendations were based on number per acre, but if you've got a hundred bluegill that are two inches versus a hundred bluegill that are six inches, you've got possibly a pretty significant for their size, uh, difference in weight. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got a hundred six inch bluegill and you over crowd your pond, all those guys live, then you could have overstocked your pond in one one go which bluegill aren't as big of a problem here we deal with mostly largemouth bass bluegill um, some people like crappie and catfish uh, the, the species selection in ponds is usually relatively low depending on the watershed where the water source is but general pond management is a lot about uh, education more mm -hmm. than anything is just modifying how people are managing the riparian area um, how they're 
fertilizing their lawns, like getting mm-hmm. people to switch from inorganic to organic fertilizers or eliminate fertilizers altogether, which is sometimes not not feasible. Getting people to stop picking ducks and geese, that's a huge one. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, that is a huge problem that we didn't really even have our heads wrapped around until fairly recently. Blue-green algae is a huge problem here. And it's becoming more and more of a problem as we get milder winters and more erratic temperatures fluctuate the year. And um, finding out that a lot of these neighborhoods have at least one kind of crazy person that decides that they want to take care of all the ducks and geese and they feed them. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge problem. What what causes what? Why is that such a huge problem? Well, in in urban systems, you generally have a certain amount of degradation that occurs just because of urban runoff that includes a lot of chemicals, a lot of herbicides, a lot of um, just nasty stuff from cars, from streets. You get road salts during the winter. Um, You get a lot of accumulation of just chemicals. And because of that, you can lose a lot of your aquatic vegetation just because of the wash-in of herbicides and things that come from lawns. Mm -hmm. Um, Once you lose a lot of your aquatic vegetation along the edge, you lose a lot of the natural filtration buffer. So when you have a lot of ducks and geese that are hanging around, not only are they going to be directly depositing their waste into the pond, so Mm -hmm. to speak, Mm -hmm. they're also going to be using the area around the pond to forage and to defecate. So then when you have a rain event um, and it's been dry for a while, then you have a lot of that stuff that washes in in one pulse. Mm -hmm. And that's a really high source of phosphorus. So it's just like algae food. And a lot of times when you have a degraded system, so when you have a healthy system, so you have green algae and you have blue green algae. Blue green algae are the ones that are directly toxic. They can produce a toxin. And it's still sort of poorly understood why and how that process is initiated, what causes them to start becoming toxic. But they are toxic directly to people and fish and other livestock. So those are the ones that you end up hearing about in the summertime being responsible for getting lakes closed down and things. It's Mm -hmm. usually a blue-green algae bloom. Green algae are not directly toxic, but they can grow at such a fast rate that they decompose at such a fast rate that it just takes out all your oxygen and you have an oxygen crash. But in a normal system, the green algae can generally outcompete the blue-green algae and keep them in check. So you have less likelihood of a blue-green algae bloom that could be toxic when you have a better balanced system. Well, in a degraded system where blue, the green algae have possibly gotten out of balance and the blue-green algae have gotten a leg up, they're sort of like legumes, like beans. Um, <clears throat> they don't need to have a source of nitrogen. They can fix atmospheric nitrogen and make it available. So if they have a source of phosphorus, like waterfowl feces, <laughs> it's just a disastrous recipe for a massive blue-green algae bloom after every rain event. And that's exactly what we're seeing happen in these urban watershed ponds is if they're already having issues with blue-green algae, every time we have a rain event, we get a bloom. Mm -hmm. So that's one of our main focuses of research. Um, Also, eliminating common carp from small impoundments Mm. is a huge one that we're undertaking. Um, We're going to make a big push later this year to, we have a couple of ponds that we're already looking at starting on, but we need some more replicates. What so we're going to make a what issue does the the carp cause? Well, they become so abundant and mm. they be, they they comprise such a large amount of the available biomass in the pond that essentially just takes away from the growth of your target species. Okay. They will eat a lot of the resources that especially your forage fish need. Um, they're real omnivorous, but they do eat a lot of inverts that you're especially bluegill need, which okay. bluegill are the preferred um, forage fish for bass in Oklahoma just mm-hmm. because they reproduce so many times per year. 
and they're way less likely to become invasive than some of the other sunfish species like green sunfish. So um, be, having common carp in your pond can be dr- detrimental to the entire, entire system. Not only do they compete with your forage fish, which takes away from the growth of your, your bass or your predator fish that you're that you're trying to propagate or produce the, the most uh, weight on. They also, uh, at great numbers, can literally scour a pond. And by scouring, just by their behavior, they can decrease the water quality, mm-hmm. increase the turbidity. And just when you increase turbidity in a system where you have a lot of site feeders, then that in itself over time can decrease growth in your in mm-hmm. your apex predators in the system. So they just cause a cascade of problems that are, you know, really becoming prevalent throughout the nation with different species mm-hmm. of carp, silver carp, big head carp, common carp. Um, I know that grass carp can be problematic in some places. Here we stock them purposefully, but we buy sterile we we have to have certified sterile triploid carp in order to sell them. Okay. So uh, we do use them for uh, aquatic plant control, but they are not, they are not the same as common carp in their behavior or their diet. So they, they're strictly herb, herb, herbivorous. They do not eat anything but plants, whereas carp will eat about whatever they can get their <laughs> mouth on. Right. And, the common carp, at least, and I just I hate them. <laughs> I I'm a huge softy. I have cried over a flathead catfish that we ate because I knew how old he was, uh-huh. and like maybe there was a little bit of alcohol involved, but I was still really <laughs> sad about him. You know, well, I mean, I get sad when I see an ant that's lost. I'm like, you're never gonna find your family. You know, like I, 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 I just I, I, I I'm one of those kids that I grew up watching the original Dr. Doolittle and that's all I ever wanted was to be able to talk to animals. Mm -hmm. And so like, I feel like I actually do, you know, like people think I'm silly, you know, it's not like they're actually speaking to me in English and I'm crazy and they're talking to me in my head. No, (laughs) I just, I I study animal behavior and, and we have 25 of our own animals at home. We're those suckers that rescue other people's animals. Um, (laughs) We have four pot-bellied pigs. We have two donkeys. We have uh, rescued sul- sulcata. We have uh, four dogs, six cats. We <laughs> have two leopard tortoises, a, a rescued bearded dragon, a rescued ball python. Oh, wow. Um, it's a little crazy, but, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, we used to have chickens and geese and ducks, and mm, we have coyotes, so now we have none of those, uh. but... But yeah, we, I've always been an animal person, always really loved anything having to do with animals. Thought at one point I could be a vet, but no, I'm too soft. Mm. It would have been too traumatic for me. So, but what, what, what else can I tell you? I know that John told you a little bit about like some of our other hobbies. Yeah. Well, I need to go check out your YouTube channel and watch some of the, the videos you were talking about. Oh my gosh, I would love that. I will say that they're not very well developed. <laughs> uh, we 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 are not uh, videographers by any means. We just got a GoPro. And we're like, this is fantastic. So I loaded a video of us shocking carp. Yeah. And John last night, he's like, you got to get a better mic. Because about two minutes in here in the drone of that generator, I was about done. And I was like, okay, good feedback. Thank you, John. But, um, but yeah, we're going to keep developing that. Um, Funny enough, somebody, one of our clients, a potential client, gave me the idea for starting a, a YouTube. He wanted us to come out and shock his seven-acre pond for free because he was <laughs> going to put us on his YouTube channel and possibly get us on the news. Well, he was wanting to create a trophy crappie fishery out of a pond, which is essentially unheard of, and nobody's really made it work, hmm. as far as I can tell in Oklahoma. One of my good friends that's another biologist that works with us, recently retired from the ODWC, he's been trying to get a trophy crappie pond going in one of his own ponds for 30 years. Hmm. And it was one of those things like, I, yeah, getting on the news sounds great, but I'm not going to put my name behind something that I can't guarantee right. was is a possibility, and I'm not going to do this for free. <laughs> um 
So essentially he gave me the idea to start the YouTube yeah, channel you and I ran with it. So <laughs> cool. yeah, I'll check that out. Um, it's it's it, small and it's not very well developed, but it's a start. And I, I really think it's a, it's, it's a beast of a platform. Oh yeah, for sure. There, it's got a lot of power to it. If I could figure out how to use it. <laughs> That's the trick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so is bass the most common uh, that people try to, promote in their ponds yes and it's a it's sort that's sort of a i feel bad and here's another dirty secret and this might get me some hate mail but i don't really like bass very much i on the scale of interest in fishes they're not one of my top interests mm -hmm. i think they're fascinating and they're really a a a fun fish to grow because they do grow so fast but in terms of what we, what I'd like to see is, I mean, I'd, I'd just like to see more, uh, more variety. Everyone wants to have a bigger bass than their neighbor. That's the <laughs> whole thing. Every guy wants the 10 pound bass in his pond so he could tell his buddy he's got a 10 pound bass in his pond. And that seems to be like the only impetus behind it. It's like having a better neighbor, that better lawn than your neighbor, which right. I think is a little silly. I would personally like to encourage some, unique and novel types of management strategies that most of my landowners just aren't going to be into like putting gar in their ponds mm. you know we've got some preliminary research out of texas that the trophy bass fisheries are also present in lakes where they have a good population of uh, particularly alligator gar i think they're seeing it with spotted gar as well because i don't i'm not going to be able to get my hands on the alligator gar mm -hmm. well that and my old boss probably would put up a fight and He's the one that does that stuff. Gotcha. So I'd have to be stepping on his toes a little to get those guys, but possibly been getting some spotted gar he'd be all right with. And, and as long as we're doing everything on private uh, waters, it doesn't really matter to the ODWC. They're, mm -hmm. they're on board with what we want to try. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's bass and sunfish and catfish. They want crappie too, which don't work together. They just don't. Crappie and bass and bluegill don't really hmm. create the best fishery. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, a lot of people already have crappie in their ponds because they've been stocked at some point and they just are like any other species. You're not going to completely eradicate something unless you, well, and I'm, I don't know that you could completely eradicate almost any of these species from these ponds. That's why we call it control mm -hmm. for any of these invasive species. You call it control instead of eradication. I'll share uh, links to your Instagram and um, the YouTube and all that so people can go check it out. And you're also a correspondent on the Fish Nerds podcast. I uh, am. Awesome. Um, we need to get my bio up there. I have it. I have it written in a notebook and I'm just I don't know why I have not gotten it typed up and sent to John, but I need to get that done. Yeah. Now that I'm talking to you about it, I'll try to get that done for him today yeah. in a few weeks. But yeah, I have my own segment now um, called Pond Talk that I'm going to be looking for guest spots for myself. Okay. So maybe sometime I can have you on and we can talk about some of the stuff that you do with water and less about what I do with water and get the focus off me a little bit, wow. but, You're... but I do have lots of stories to tell. So that is, that is one of my, one of my draws and my downfalls is that <laughs> I, I tend to tell a lot of stories awesome. and I'm just, I'm just ecstatic to have found out about you guys because just more and more and more women are coming into this field in mm -hmm. some form or fashion. And yep. the more we can draw in the younger women and show them that there's no exclusions. You can be absolutely anything that you want to be. You can be a scientist. You can work with water. You can still be pretty or be a tomboy or be anything that you want to be. And that's one of our main missions, too, is is getting more women in STEM, more women around water, mm -hmm. more women that are willing to be out boots on the ground advocating for our watersheds you know you may not claim that you're a scientist but i guarantee you you're still a steward for the waters that you're putting your people in right and you are promoting stewardship and teaching them about 
things, you have to teach them about things like invasive species if you're sending somebody out on a boat. So there is a certain amount of education and outreach that you do um, that I would call very scientific. So regardless of whether that's what your degree is in, you're still out there, boots on the ground in the water, and that's important. Oh, I also got recently asked to be on the board of directors for a nonprofit that my friend is starting. She works for the Nature Conservancy. Oh, cool. And uh, she's currently an LLC, but she's getting it transferred to nonprofit so that we can start getting grants to do research. But Mm -hmm. um, it will be called the Watershed Movement. Okay. And our main uh, purpose will be for outreach and education for adults and children about watershed health and you know, what is a watershed? How do you how do you read watersheds? Uh, how to care for your watershed? So um, there's a lot of opportunities that are going to come out of that as well. Yeah. So that's an interesting, uh, interesting new thing that, that came about. In fact, we just went on a me and two of the uh, board members went on two female biologists went on a float trip slash sort of business meeting this week last weekend at, at the Illinois River in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, northeastern Oklahoma. Well, very cool. Thanks so much for this awesome conversation. And just a reminder for everybody listening to go to the show notes for this episode. So you can go check out Amy online and her YouTube channel. And that's going to be at thewomanangler.com slash 145. That's thewomanangler.com slash 145. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>